bit them on the right and the moderator will try to get to them if there's time. So up next, we have Henri Pierre Jacques from Harlem Capital Partners and Alex Conrad from Forbes. Wow. Henri, I, uh, <laughs> I don't think I've ever had an Olive Garden intro before, but thank you for you talking with us today. Thanks for having me. For those of us, um, you know, in the audience who may not be super familiar with Harlem Capital Partners, do you mind giving us some context about your fund and sort of how long you've been operating and, and the types of companies that you have backed? Yeah, sure. Uh, so Harlem Capital, we've been around for about four and a half years. We started in December of 2015 um, as an angel syndicate where we were investing our own money um, across asset classes and eventually focused on venture. We launched the fund in June of 2018 we had our final close in November 2019 at 40 million uh, with the focus of investing in women and minority founders um, focused in the US. Uh, so a typical check size is a half a million, $10 million, typically for five to 10% ownership. Uh, we are industry agnostic. So we've invested in 11 industries with FinTech software and HR tech being our top three. Uh, we've also invested in 10 cities across the US uh, with New York, LA and Boston as our top three. So we're, we're as agnostic as it gets. Uh, we typically don't do deep tech, which we consider to be biotech, cryptocurrency, quantum mechanics. And we also don't do capital intensive industries like hardware, ag tech, um, infrastructure, et cetera. Got it. So that was some of the stuff you don't do. Um, can you maybe give us a sense of some of the projects that you have backed or kind of the types of companies that are most interesting to you right now? Yeah, I mean, so our top three industries right now are fintech, HR tech, and software, but we, we do really invest in most things. Um, one of our more, most recent investments that we announced last week uh, is a company called Four Degrees. It's an AI CRM system uh, based in Chicago run by a Nigerian uh, founder called Ablorde. Uh, and basically they're trying to do what Affinity and Salesforce has done, but how do you actually make it so people who don't know what they're searching for in their CRM system can be told it, right? And so part of our issue, we actually became a customer before we led the seed round. Uh, part of our issue was we didn't need a CRM system that we could type in somebody's name to get their information. We wanted to know what should we know. Uh, and so four degrees is really unique where if I have on my calendar, it's integrated to my, my Google. Um, it knows I'm taking a trip in three weeks. It says, hey, you're going to LA. Here are five contacts based off of your recent messages that you should reach out to. Or another thing that it does is it reaches out and says, hey, six months ago, these three people closed seed deals. You should reach out to them. Right. And so it's trying to be really proactive. And that's really unique from a relationship perspective. Uh, a lot of my friends who are in the venture private equity space have actually become customers. And uh, we think they're really uniquely positioned to become a relationship manager versus a go to. Let me search for what I'm looking for in the CRM system. Very cool. So, um, Henri, how, how did you become a VC in the first place? Yeah, so I never actually worked in venture. I did kind of the typical track of investment banking for two years, private equity for two years, uh, and then Harvard Business School. Um, so we started the, the fund as an angel syndicate, as I mentioned. So all of us just loved investing. We were like, what we're doing at work, why don't we do this for ourselves? Uh, Jared, my partner, he was actually my cue mate in private equity. Uh, I turned to him one day, December of 2015, and said, hey, would you want to put up $10,000 uh, and let's, let's do what we're doing at work for ourselves? I texted to my roommate who I worked with in banking for two years. He texted his roommate who was at Google. And then next week we met in Jared's living room and started putting together what we what became Harlem Capital. Uh, so it really was organic. We weren't even venture focused. We weren't diversity focused. Over the next year and a half, we realized that we liked to venture the most and 90% of our deal flow was coming from venture. We realized that most of our portfolio was diverse, even though it wasn't our thesis. And so we said, hey, why don't we focus on being a venture firm for diverse founders? Um, and then fast forward two years, Jared and I get to Harvard Business School. Um, I was recruiting for VC jobs and we both worked at a black owned private equity firm. And I personally was like, none of the firms that I want to go to have any black partners. Um, and when you go from an all black owned PE firm to a no black partner firm, that to me just wasn't an option. Uh, and then so, and then the gender, the diversity focused firms were mostly diverse, were gender focused, like Female Founders Fund, BBG. And I wanted to invest in people of color as well as women. Uh, and so I ended up applying for a fellowship from Harvard Business School, where basically you can become an entrepreneur over the summer and they'll give you a small stipend. I got it. Uh, Jared didn't get the private equity internship he wanted. I convinced him to join me on that fellowship. And then that summer between first and second year, we, we started the fundraise and eventually 
that's what we ended up doing after school. Um, but it was not a clear linear path that we took. Well, how did um, investing kind of in practice, uh, you know, kind of uh, surprise or, or be kind of what you might have expected as, as we were kind of mapping out your firm? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest difference from going from investing to a GP is all the non-investing stuff, right? And so I think people don't understand like when you're a GP, unless you're on a live deal that's high priority, like 75% of your time plus is on non-investing, particularly if you're fundraising, then it becomes 80 plus percent of your time is non-deal stuff related, right? And so all the stuff where we're doing taxes right now, which we're doing in July, um, onboarding of, of new uh, interns or associates. We just chose our healthcare plan last month because we just got our first employees who started in May. Um, all the brand stuff. Exactly what a VC wants to do, right? Is exactly. about healthcare plans. <laughs> and so I think that that's really the biggest transition is going from, okay, I get a sim on my table. Let me do my analysis on the deal to like, there's all these other things you have to do, particularly when you're fundraising, which is a job in itself. Um, which I underappreciate. I think the biggest transition from private equity to venture is how are you get how are you uncomfortable uncom being uncomfortable? Because in PE, there's just tons of data. And so that was my biggest transition was, hey, there are ways to leverage data in venture. I think a lot of people use less data than they probably could. Like seed today, you know, 65% of seed deals today are post revenue, right? That was 11% in 2010. And so the bar is only getting higher. There's more data and companies are becoming later and later stage of the seed stage. And so I don't think there's a world now where you can't do analysis for a seed stage business, but still, regardless of the data, you're not gonna have nearly as much comfortability as you would in private equity, but you're also not writing 40 to $200 million equity checks. And so you don't need as much comfortability, right? And so I think that, that was a balance for me of making that transition from private equity to venture capital. Got it. How, um, how, how have you found kind of the mix of, um, sort of identifying businesses uh, maybe a little bit faster than other investors versus perhaps taking a bet on businesses that are not yet attractive to perhaps other investors, you know, kind of the, the spotting versus the, the winning the deal. Yeah. So when we first started, we only did post revenue. Um, once we raised the fund, our target was 25. We hit our cap of 40 we realized that ownership really begins to matter about above $30 million for a fund. Um, and so if we were gonna hit our ownership targets, we were gonna have to move earlier, particularly given where valuations were pre-COVID. And so we became post-product focused. So we've done 15 deals from the fund, three of the 15 have been pre-revenue. So we still typically are post-revenue, um, but we will move earlier or like a lot of our deals have been 6K MRR, so super early from a revenue traction stage. And so I think we just realized as a fund, given our ownership, our check size, we had to move earlier. We had to get comfortable faster based on, hey, great founder, big market. We think the UN economics makes sense. The business will likely pivot, but we can't assess the business as much as we would have liked to if we were a 15 to $20 million fund where we can get in later and ownership doesn't matter as much. And so I think the size of your fund, the size of your check size, your ownership targets all determine like how early you can go and how early you can't go for a lot of these businesses. Um, and that's what we, we didn't appreciate that before we actually had a $40 million fund. Got it. Do you find the entrepreneurs that you typically meet with feel like they have um, other options in terms of capital though, or, or kind of how, what is, what is the sense of, of um, the, the competitive nature get, you know, with early stage underrepresented, you know, entrepreneurs, like I assume, you know, a lot of the ones you're meeting. Yeah, so 87% of our portfolio is Black, Latino, or women. Um, so it's the majority of our, our companies with two other ones being Asian. Um, and so we're, you know, I think we want to invest in a deal, obviously, if there aren't other investors. Like typically because of our check size, particularly outside of, we've not invested in San Francisco. So we've invested in 11 cities, but out of SF. Uh, and so we usually are the top two largest checks. There's actually not as many seed funds writing 750K to million dollar checks as you would think. We were not aware of that until we actually got in this position, particularly in New York. There's very few true seed funds. You have the GCs and NEAs who have side offices in New York, but it's not their main core business. Um, and so I think we thought we would lead probably a third of our deals. We're now going to probably lead a half just because of the facto of our check size. And so I think that definitely has changed from a fund size perspective and given how many micro funds there are that are writing 250K to 500K checks. Um, and so we usually like to have other, at least some institution who's writing a 250K plus check for us to close around. So even if we get there, we give a term sheet, 
we always will have some minimum. So if it's like a million and a half seed round, then we'll typically have a 1.25 million uh, minimum threshold. And we want to see one other investor that we think is a real validation, even, but we'll step out before the other investor is there. Um, because, you know, this isn't private equity. It's not a, you're going to buy the company. Like you need downstream capital to work. And fundamentally, we think that 99% of businesses that start are in existing markets, right? And we think about the businesses we're in for HR tech or FinTech or software, like there's not many new things that are being created in those spaces from like a, a new market, right? Airbnb or Uber, those are very rare. And so it's pretty easy to assess, hey, who are the investors in this space? We do a lot of comps analysis. We talk to a lot of investors to get a sense of what would you need to see? What are the multiples in the space? Um, and we just fundamentally believe that most businesses are created in existing markets. And so you can get some sense of, will people actually care about this? Will people actually invest in it? Or is this really just a moonshot bet? And that's typically how we think about it. And then occasionally there's those Ubers and Airbnbs, but those are very rare new market creations. How, um, how collaborative would you say the venture game is at, at sort of the seed stage right now? Um, obviously the average seed round got a lot bigger um, but I guess, you know, there's still, is probably more syndication than later on, but, but is this something where you, you all kind of can find, find room in the, in the deals that you want, or are you having to kind of compete with other funds, you know, looking for the same founders? Yeah. So we've lost one deal, um, which was in December. So we've only lost one deal, all of the deals we've won and we've been fortunate to get into, uh, it's a very small world. So we're very collaborative. I mean, given our check size, we, we do have to be earlier. Um, but I think there hasn't been an issue because there aren't a lot of funds doing million plus checks at the seed stage. Um, you know, obviously the funds that are larger that are doing 20% ownership at the seed stage, we're not investing with them. Uh, there's, it's just not, it's not worth our time from an opportunity cost perspective. Um, but all the other funds, we have a lot of co-investors who, you know, one of our biggest co-investors is a fintech firm in Boston called uh, Vesico Ventures right, which is an all white male fintech firm in Boston. Uh, and they're one of our, we've done three co-investments with them, right? So it's not only diversity focused funds that we're co-investing with, um, it just depends on the space and the time where we found partners who really like the deals that we like and we've done deals with them. Uh, and it hasn't been kind of like this, this battle tension that I heard, you know, we haven't invested in the Valley, so maybe it's different in SF, but we personally have not seen that issue outside of San Francisco. Okay. And, but you feel like there is, um, at least before the last couple of weeks, has there been sort of a consistent um, interest from other firms to kind of share deal flow with you all or see some of these entrepreneurs that you've been backing? Yeah. So, I mean, from a funnel perspective, we're much more inbound than most firms, right? So 50% of our deals come directly from founders, and that's because we're very brand focused. 13% uh, of our funnel comes from venture, and then another 15 from kind of like our network. Um, and 10% comes from our, from our interns, actually. And so we have a pretty diversified pipeline. And, you know, from a venture standpoint, for us, because we are, are so diverse, right, we've invested in 11 cities and 10 industries, there are very few firms that are going to have multiple overlap with us, right? You think about funds like Andreessen, which are 90% plus San Francisco-based, well, if we've never invested in SF, we're probably not going to invest with Andreessen, right? If you're talking about a firm that's invested in biotech, we don't invest in biotech. And so we're pretty methodical about who we actually spend time with but very few firms outside of Vestigo or Female Founders Fund or Precursor have done multiple deals with us just because we are so uh, agnostic across geography and industry. Um, and so we're, we're, we're just more mindful of that. I think some firms have, hey, here's our, our six firm uh, rotation. We have our monthly calls. We don't do that. It doesn't really work for us. Uh, it's not a high ROI um, given our funnel base and our inbounds are pretty large. Like last year, 47% of our deals that we did were directly from management. Right, and so we actually, we're, we're, we're trying to be very conscious of how do we get people of color to women outside of our networks? Because I think you would be naive to say, okay, I'm a person of color, like I'm gonna have a more diverse network. Yeah, but like I live in New York City, I went to Harvard Business School, I worked in banking. My diverse network is very elitist. Um, and so we're very focused on how do we leverage a brand and marketing to make sure that we're reaching people of color and women outside of our networks. And that to me is what gets me excited when you know we did a deal called ProSky in Salt Lake City and the founder, Crystal is 38 years old, Asian woman, has two kids. There is no way I would ever have met her in our networks, right? And she read an article on us in the Wall Street Journal. She reached out. I flew to Salt Lake City, met her and her brother, who's the COO, and we ended up investing. That to me is like when you have a true network and you've gone outside and you have some proprietary deal flow, 
Um, and that's what I'm more focused on than just like, can I tap my HBS friends at other VC firms to get the deals that everybody else is looking at? Got it. So cold introductions actually have worked for you all in terms of investments. Yeah, very, very well. Last year we did seven deals in 2019. Three of the seven were cold introductions. That's, that's great. Um, do, you, do you see a place for sort of the warm intro network that VCs operated for a long time in, you know, alongside that or? Yeah, I think you have to have both. Okay. You have to have both. Um, you know, this year, uh, it will definitely be less from like a code inbound just because of COVID. And I think that's a, that's a concern for a lot of minorities and women is like, if I'm not in those networks. So we've still done deals where like, we've done three deals in the last six weeks where we never met the founder. Right. But they were either from a VC we knew, a founder we knew, or somebody kind of in our networks to like get that in introduction. And so I think during COVID, the network will become more important um, just because you can't actually meet them. And if I get an inbound from somebody, usually if I don't know you, like I at least want to see your face. Though I will caveat that with saying, we've gotten to know founders better post COVID than pre COVID. Like the fact that I can have multiple Zoom calls with you. I'm not traveling, going to a bunch of conferences. I have much more time now to focus on deals. You have much more time to focus on getting your round done versus being distracted. It's actually led to me having more phone calls with the founder, more going deeper into the teams versus just the C-suite and doing more investor and customer call references. And so I, I think we've gotten comfortable where we realize, okay, we met the founder before COVID, but a two hour in-person meeting doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean I know you at all as a person. Right. And so I think it's, it's kind of like a fluff and it's a nice check the box. Like I met the founder, I went to the office for five hours and I was satisfied. There's actually an office, but in reality, like having multiple conversations two or three times a week, getting to text a person, talking to them on a weekend because you're trying to get to committee. Like I personally have gotten to know the founders more now than I did before because both of us are just not as distracted as we were before. I find that fascinating. So, so you feel like you can kind of get a good read on a person without you know, completely virtually in a way that going to their office doesn't necessarily do. Yeah, because you can do more references, right? One of our cases at HBS was on the fact that interviews are pointless and that people have so many biases. So like to, to the, the question you ask leads to the answer you get, right? And so for us, like the references is actually often just as important as getting to know the founder, whether that's investor references, customer references, or personal references, I think now we're at the point where we've invested in a lot of top women and diverse founders. They all know each other. So we can get references pretty quickly from a personal perspective. And investor references are important because one thing we learned during angel investing before we had the fund was founders are different before you write the check and after you write the check, right? And so talking to investors who've been in the deal for two years, like, hey, like, what have they been like the last two years? Has that evolved? Has that changed? no two weeks or five weeks of diligence can tell you what somebody has seen over two years. Like you can only, you can lie in a two hour in-person meeting pretty easily to somebody's face and the same on a camera, but you can't lie to an investor for two years and then not notice it. Right. And so that to us is really powerful. And typically we know some of the investors or angels who are in these deals, um, even if they didn't do the introductions. And so that gives us a lot of insight to, Hey, like how they acted, are they taking your feedback? Like what are the things that they're missing? How can we help as investors? Like, what do you feel like their new investor base needs? And that's really meaningful and, and powerful for us versus just, okay, I taught this person for two hours. Like now I know what this person's gonna be like for 10 years. Like you're lying to yourself if you think that's true. Um, and so I think, you know, we just kind of come to reality like, yes, like we wanna make sure we think we trust you, but it's like, we think we trust you. Um, and let's talk to other people who have had a longer period to think they trust you, but they still only known you for six months or 12 months. And then we'll come to our own conclusion. That's the bet you make, right? That's the 1% the venture funnel that you do. And you hope that that decision is right, but you're going to have a loss ratio regardless of how smart you think you are. So um, I'm dying to know like how entrepreneurs act differently, but can, for, for those who are in the audience, can you give any advice of sort of the way, the, the way they, they can make a good impression or the way you would like to see them, you know, interact with investors like yourself? Yeah, I wrote a blog piece about this a few weeks ago. I think one thing is, this is a long-term relationship on both sides, right? And that's one thing I underappreciate, right? A lot of investors feel like they have the power. When we were doing our fundraising, our LPs, one of our LPs talked to five of our founders, another LP talked to three of our founders for reference checks. Everybody is reference checking, reference checking everybody, right? It's a relationship game. It's a long-term game. And so I think 
don't take it personally. Like we invest in 1% of companies. There's an opportunity cost. One of the biggest reasons why we don't invest is because of that. It's not because your business isn't good. Um, and so I think when I see people who respond with emails like, oh, why wouldn't you take the time to at least take a call with me? Like every investor has different philosophies. We typically see a thousand deals a year. We take calls with 200, right? We diligence 40, we invest in 10. That's our funnel. Other founders see a thousand deals. They talk to 500 different perspectives and nobody's right or wrong. You know, a lot of venture funds aren't making real money and we're all still in the journey together trying to figure out if we actually are good. And for a lot of venture investors, this is the first recession they've ever done, period. Um, and so I think, you know, just be mindful of that and that these emails get shared. I remember when I was in banking, you know, reading Business Insider, every year there'd be at least two or three emails that were stupid by an MD or an analyst that would get shared across the street. And now your name's just, you're blacklisted. Venture is no different. It may not be in the newspaper because it's not an investment bank, but like people are sharing emails. People will remember, people talk about you. So be respectful. Your emails get shared. People remember those interactions. And I think what's been really grateful is when somebody's like, thank you for telling me no quickly. Like that's what we try to do, at least tell them no quickly and give them a reason. And then they come back or then they introduce us to another founder. Hey, like they didn't invest in us, but we like them. Like you may want to look at them. Because um, it's respectful of their time. Yeah, it's respectful of their time. I think that's something that founders should just appreciate is everybody is trying to do the right thing. Though like I, obviously in this racial climate, there are definitely biases. And I've seen emails that have been posted by founders of color that were pretty disheartening. Um, and so I'm not saying it's the case every time, but the majority of interactions is to be mindful and typically it's not from a bad place. Uh, you just wanna be mindful of like the words you're saying and the, way, the things you're communicating. So um, I, I know that you and Jared have, your phone's been like blowing up in recent days from your peers in VC, from entrepreneurs. I saw you guys got name checked on national TV, which is pretty cool. Um, but I'm curious, you know, given that people probably want to be better educated or get some expertise from, you know, folks who have been investing in underrepresented founders for a while, are there sort of any like basic places to start or, or ways that people can ground themselves so that they are respectful of your time and can actually put in the work here? Yeah, a lot of, a lot of emails recently. Um, I would say, you know, the, the venture term right now is wire and hire which I agree long-term makes sense. I think in the short term, people need to first focus on their, themselves and you need to self-reflect, take a yoga retreat, med meditation, whatever you have to do, but analyze your own sourcing funnel from a deal perspective and a talent perspective. And what are you doing to actually leverage data, right? So I'll, do, I'll start with the wire part, which is deals, right? From a funnel perspective, we track everything, geography, race, gender, Right? And so we look at, okay, how does our deal flow compared to our sourcing funnel? So for instance, 58% of our deals that are inbound or get sourced are from black Latino founders. 57% of our portfolio is black Latino founders. 43% of our deals source come from women. 47% of our portfolio is women, right? Like there's a reason because it's really hard when you're trying to do one out of a hundred deals. If your funnel is not diverse, it's almost impossible to have a diverse at the, top, at the bottom of the funnel for 1%, right? And so I think first, if you're not tracking race, you're not tracking gender, then you're fooling yourself that anything will change if you email me and ask for me to send you a black founder. It's not gonna be enough. You need a lot of founders of color, a lot of women. Um, and you also need to assess the biases, right? For us three years ago, we were passing more on women. We, we also track why we pass, right? And so one of our past reasons was too early. We were passing on women for too early, but they actually had more revenue because we track revenue as well. And so we corrected that. And now we have an equal proportion of too early as a past reason for men and women. Even people of color, even women GPs are going to have biases against themselves. So unless you actually track that, you're not going to know that, right? And so now, three years later, we've gotten to a point where half our portfolio is essentially women. Um, now, moving to the higher side, uh, which is also really important, you have to have 83% of funds don't have a Black investor, period, let alone a partner. Um, and so for us, that's been the intern program. Both of our senior associates came from our intern program. Um, and so it's really important, what are you creating, whether it's a scouting program, intern program, fellowship to get talent in the door. And also same thing for our intern program, our last class, we had 865 applications, we hired six. Of that class, 68% were people of color, 40% were women, right? We're tracking gender and race by that in every stage of our interview process. We have three stages of our interview process. Each stage we're correlating, okay, how many did we let into this round compared to what actually exists? It doesn't have to be perfect, but at least are we not way off? What, did it go from 60% people of color to 30% in the round, round two? 
why is that the case, right? And so each round we're looking at the data to track as we do our interviews, are we at least being reasonably fair? We do the same thing for schools, geographies, industries as well, so that we make sure we're not biased. We don't have all these people from the same school, or the same industry. And so I think data drives decisions. And so until you can actually analyze your data, real decisions long-term will not be changed. I think too many people right now are just moving and asking for founders of color and people of color, but they haven't assessed their internal systems. And I think it's going to lead to continued flawed systems that they already have. Well, that's really helpful advice. Hopefully the industry will take to heart and they can follow you and Jared on Twitter and, and read the blog post to hopefully better educate. So thanks for the time, Henri. Really thanks, appreciate, appreciate it. it.